He was one of the typical World War II guys, you know, never said anything about this whole deal over there and didn't really talk about himself and all, about anything really. It was all just going to work, raising kids and, you know, trying to do the right thing kind of a guy, you know. Basically he was a, a barber. Most of us, that was what I was main deal with being a barber and he was kind of an entertainer. Um, before the war, Right out of high school, he um, one of his jobs was he was a dance instructor. So he would go and do all these Frank um, Fred Astaire dances, you know, yes. new dances, and they have people go around and he'd be there with some woman showing them how to do the, that particular dance. So at that time, in the in the in the well, he was born in twenty, so probably you know late thirties or early forties. That's what he was doing, and he went to the war. And it was interesting, on his application, it said he was he did that before going into the service. So they thought he was like an entertainment guy, so they put him as a radio guy instead of an infantry guy. So that kind of, he said, that probably saved my life. He said, I've probably been shot when I went over and, you know, went on the beaches and all that crap, you know. He says, but I was a radio guy, so they put me up on top of a hill and I'd relay the messages to where the enemy was. And then they'd shoot from the ship. To get them, so they're always looking. The enemy was trying to get rid of me, the scout, and he got a purple heart because they blew his jeep up one time. He just happened to jump out of it in time, and <laughs> and so, you know, <clears throat> but that that little thing probably kept him alive during the war because of that assignment. And then he came home and just instead of going to college on the GI Bill, he decided I got to go to work. He got married, they had kids right away. You know, and he just started going to work as a finance guy, and then eventually he got to um, decide he wanted to be a barber, and he did some barbering in the service just to make a few extra bucks, you know. But he's a pretty smart guy, you know. Um, and um, How do you suppose you're different? Worked hard. I think he worked hard, you know. I mean, he just went to work every day and tried to make ends meet. and Really, he always felt like, um, sometimes he'd say to me, say, I really feel like I was a failure. I didn't really, I don't have anything to give you kids or anything like that, you know. And we try to tell him, hey, you're all right, man. You did a good job. You gave us what we needed, and, you know. And you, you, you did a good job. Don't worry about it. But, you know, because I got a brother who's a, you know, he's a, he was an oncologist, a real bright guy, you know. <clears throat> And then it was me and then my other brothers got married and had kids and had a steady job. Everybody's been married and just good, solid, you know, no problems. So it says something, you know, for him and my mom. Oh, much more free-spirited and wild. Yeah, this kind of was the black sheep in the family. If somebody was going to do something crazy, it'd be me, try something. So, you know, he, I don't think he was, at least I don't know that part of him. I don't know anybody that ever said that about him. And I really think that, you know, what happened, and to, everything revolves to me, I, I got to the point where I'm just, everything revolves around every money, commerce, opportunity, and what gives you opportunity is more income, and what, you know, you can branch out, you don't worry about this, or you can explore that, you know, and you got to, you know, cut down trees every day for eight hours, you don't have a lot of energy to go do something else, and I think my my dad's generation and before that, first of all, they weren't a highly educated society and they were just working all the time. You started working when you were a kid, right? And it's like, then all of a sudden, you know, started going to college, the economy changed, all of us assholes went to school and thought we were smart and started demonstrating and blah, 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 and get into this, that, and the other because we had freedom. We could tell everybody to go shit in their hat, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> We were in the playoffs and I had a buddy of mine from Kentucky and he was up there. I said, hey, let's go, you ever, let's just get a cab. So we got a, um, I went to the ITOA place and for like 35 bucks you could get a cab and it's just whatever you made, you made on tip and you'd have to pay for your own gas. 
So we were in the car, we're driving around picking people up and stuff like that. I'm driving the cab and he's in there. Pretty soon, like people didn't want to get in the cab with us because he was in the cab too. So I said, Dave, you got to get out. I, nobody wants to get in the cab with the both of us. So I left him out and he walked around town a little bit and I picked some people up. And that and crazy thing happened that, um, that night. Um, I was stopped at um, an intersection there on Boston and Tremont. Yeah. And the guy knocks on it and gets in. He says, where are you going? He goes, I'm going to Newton. I go, oh, that's a good ride. So I'm going down to the Mass Pike. And all of a sudden he tells me he's a reporter. And he had been at a hockey game. His name was Hoppenick. And he started the sport, started the Sports Illustrated for Kids. He yeah. was like the editor of that after a while. And I really didn't know him. He was covering hockey. He wasn't a basketball guy. So I said, son of a bitch. Because then you know, you're on the short way, you're telling him, and all of a sudden it's going around, and Cowns is driving a cab. And he finds out he's sitting in a hockey game, the Bruins game. So he gets out of his, he walks out of the hockey game, starts walking the streets of Boston looking for my cab. And he found it. At that intersection. Oh, that's crazy, right? So now everybody thinks that I stopped playing basketball to drive a cab. Right. That's the story because they were so close in time right. that one just nobody understands it. Had, okay. And I did the, drove the cab for one night. Yeah. That's it. One just as a lark, just to do something. You know, yeah. so, kind of silly. So anyway, I've been. They said it on TV the other day. It was like, it's like 30 years later. Um, Ben Gundy says, yeah, Cowan was always my favorite player. And do you think any of these guys would ever stop playing basketball and go drive a cab <laughs> for a living? <laughs> well, come on, man. <laughs> but anyway, it goes on. The story goes on. So there was another one. I just try to do the right thing day in and day out, you know. I mean, and pick, you know, you always, all these truisms, as you always heard, they, they are all true. Right. They really are. I mean, they're time-tested. Time and you know, um, you're a lot like the people you associate with. That's what people are going to think about you, and you may start thinking about yourself the same way. So, you know, be selective in who you choose as buddies and you want to hang around with. Right. Um, try not to take shortcuts. You know, just pay the price. If you can't do it, ask for help. I think one of the things that, that I would say that would have helped me a lot is if I would have just been more um, inquisitive and asked questions and went and got help when I was like struggling with making a decision instead of trying to do it all by myself and figure it out and sort of get in, in, enveloped in my own like you know me it's all about me you know and think about am I going to retire I want to do this or I don't like this and you just and you think about it and you think about it and you think about it you know the best thing to do is just go talk to somebody about and that's what I would suggest to everybody. Just, okay, if you're having a problem, stop like thinking about it by yourself and go talk to somebody that you really respect. Right. And you'll get a whole different look at it. Our coach used to um, say in college, he goes, you know, um, you almost need a third person to come in. You know, it's like that's what a counseling thing comes in. You and me, we're having a big problem. We'll bring somebody else. Just let somebody else sit around and listen to the damn thing. They'd be able to say one or two things that help you guys out. Is you're never going to get anywhere here because you're too in, you're too entrenched right. in your deal. So don't be afraid to bring a third party in. You know what I mean? I think that's as you grow. That's I think good advice for all men because men tend to think, "Well, I can handle this shit on my own." You know what I mean? Right.